Hello everybody, Martin here. Today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. Um, this is uh, going to be a strategy video. I'm going to be talking about sideboarding with a storm. So, um, first of all, I would just like to briefly touch on a couple of things, like overarching things. And that those are like mainly like subjectivity that I am not the authority. I'm probably not even a authority and authority on sideboarding. So take this for what it is. It is um, my attempt at mm. describing how I approach sideboarding with this deck in Legacy. Um, also, be mindful that there are different builds of ad nauseum tendrils, and I'm I'm going to try to sort of get around that by talking in generalities, but I suppose I won't completely be able to escape talking from a, a sort of a subjective point of view of how I play the deck and the deck choices that I that I make, but. That should be the, the biggest issue, and I guess lastly, just be aware that also this is, uh, I think, even though Legacy is often uh, talked about as being this glacial, uh, like, so slow-moving format, it is, it is a, a format in, in flux, so, you know, if you're watching this, say three years after I've recorded it, maybe some like the meta has changed, and some of the the, uh, the matchup analyses that I try to, to to display here won't really be relevant, or you know, new cards will come in. But you know, that that is just a, a brief aside. So, I would, one last thing before I jump in, and that is just to say this video is mostly intended for. I guess uh, newer players of, of the deck archetype. So if you're like a grizzled storm veteran, maybe one or two or multiple things that I that I describe that I end up discussing uh, will well certainly won't be news to you. Might not have much worth, and you might straight up disagree. And if that's the case, that's awesome. I would love to to read some comments. Um, because maybe that's also a way for me to 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 get better. All right. So the first subject today is going to be a bit of a like theory crafting on sideboarding with Storm. And um, one thing is Storm is an in, an incredibly sort of like streamlined, efficient deck for game one. I would. I don't want to be like guessing how large a percentage of the decks in tier one and tier one and a half of Legacy are at a disadvantage versus Storm Game One, but it's 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 non-trivial uh, percentage for sure. And that what that means is that <clears throat> our deck is extremely well set up to beat most other decks Plan A. Um, there are a couple of exceptions, well, maybe not exceptions, but like there are a couple of decks in Legacy that run cards in their main deck that sort of function as sideboarded cards. And here I'm primarily talking about um, hateful permanence. So like uh, something uh, sort of commonly referred to as sphere effects. Because uh, that harkens back to Sphere of Resistance, and that's a card that uh, costs you mana, and it uh, makes all your spells, every spell cast, cost one more. So commonly, commonly used Sphere effects in Legacy are, but it's, it's mostly actually just one is in Thalia, Guardian of Thraven. Um, Thalia is played in Death and Taxes and Maverick. And Thalia is a game one, like they have, the decks that run Thalia will mostly always have her, like in the main deck, so 
if you face a deck like that, it can sometimes feel like they have main decked sideboard stuff for you. Another, there are two other sort of, I think, relevant examples to, to make, and one is Counterbalance out of Miracles. Um, counterbalance combined with Sensei's Divine on top will often sort of be a lock game one where we don't have answers for it. And the, lastly, it's, it's Chalice of the Void. Um, this is especially relevant since the uh, introduction of the old Drazi deck. But there are other archetypes that also run Chalice of the Void in the main deck. And like those three cards, so Thalia, Counterbalance, Chalice of the Void, those three cards are like commonly like commonly used as sort of like uh, th like those effects would normally be like sideboarded stuff that decks got to bring in against us after game one but there are a few decks that get to run these game uh, game uh, pre-boarded in game one so anyway moving on from that that kind of means that um, most of our sideboard because like against most most decks we are really well set up to beat their plan A they don't have uh, much of a way to interact with us that means that most of our sideboard usually will be dedicated to uh, anti-hate like answers to their answers so let's say that you're playing against uh, like a blue-white control deck maybe they will bring in white hate bears like maybe they'll they will have like either sworn canonist or meddling mage okay so now we have to deal with that so we might want to bring in removal or um we might be in uh, like against a deck that wa wants to bring in like sphere of resistance or chalice of the void so we have to have artifact removal um it might also just be that this is a deck that gets to bring in like more of the same, more of what it already has. So, like, if it's a blue deck, it might get to bring in more counter spells. Uh, or if it's like a, a black based discard deck, it might, get, you know, bring in more discard spells. So, we might have an interest in like shoring up those kinds of angles of attack on us through our sideboard. But yeah, so mostly we're in the market to answer their answers for us as we are like the the proactive you know the beat down I guess uh, the proactive deck asking the questions all right so on to the next section and here I'll be talking about groups of sideboarded cards and basically I have um, selected let's see here five groups of cards I believe All right, the first group, I have labeled them, um, or actually, sorry, these five groups of cards, they are like um, sort of archetypical groupings that I have selected arbitrarily almost, so like it's not, I'm not sort of uh, building this on the, you know, on a solid foundation, I'm sort of, this is just what made sense to me. Uh, also, there will be cards that definitely would, would fit into several of these groups, and I've just tried to sort of allocate them to the group I thought were, were, were like they filled up their or they played out their role most uh, most of the time. So the first group I have called bombs against blue decks. So not very snappy title, but so this is basically where you want to be looking at bringing in cards that um, that just improve on your matchup against blue cards. Oh, sorry, blue decks. Like right now, the, the the main control deck in Legacy is obviously Miracles. So like this is sort of these cards are mostly tuned towards Miracles, I guess, but they also have merit in other matchups. Alright, and the first card here, or I, I guess these two kind of go together, are sto extra extra storm cards, basically. If you saw, uh, or rather, if you haven't seen the finals of GP Prague, I would 
highly suggest you go watch that. Rodrigo Tavares, a uh, fellow Storm uh, enthusiast, played an amazing final against Miracles in which he boarded in two extra copies of Tendrils of Agony. So, like, boosting his number to, to three. And lately I've been running four Tendrils of Agony versus Miracles uh, post-board. And it's basically like if you're up against a deck that does not have a significant clock and also only really has counter spells or stack based spells to interact with you well in that case the storm mechanic is just like unbelievably good because like well, it's written there, right? When you cast a spell, copy it for each spell, cast before you, uh, you cast before the turn, or cast in the turn. So, a single counter spell, like a single force of will, is going to really just crumble in the face of a stack with nine copies of tendrils. Um, and that is why, like, bringing in all these storm cards are really good against miracles. Uh, I also have a, a, a penchant for running Empty the Warrens, and like Empty the Warrens also means that you can go off without having to reach Lethal Storm. So like if if your hand has Empty the Warrens, a lot of the time you'll be able to sort of orchestrate a way where one force of will can't stop you unless they really are wise to what you're doing and counter the first ritual. And so you you might only need to make like four or five storm, and you know to make um, before you cast empty to, to to make ten or twelve goblins, and that will be enough. So I would say like against slower con like slow control decks and blue extra storm cards are really good against uh, like blue tempo decks like Delver. An extra copy of Tendrils of Agony can can do some work there, and Empty the Warrens is really also really good there. Um, but more on that later. And then we have these sort of bomby cards like City of Solitude and Defense Grid. Let's have a look at them. They're quite similar, um, and they also have a creature equivalent called Zanted Swarm. But I'll be going over that later in a different group of cards. So City of Solitude says that players can't play spells or activate activated abilities uh, during their opponent's turn. Basically what this means is uh, when it's your turn, your opponent can't cast any Force of Will, can't activate Sensei's Divine on top, can't activate Death Rite Shaman. Um, Defense Grid is a little bit less uh, powerful. It just says that each spell that you cast during your opponent's turn costs three more three more generic mana. So, like effectively, they will need to have six mana to counter twice with like a, with two force of wills if they want to use a, a counter spell. It's a full five mana. So this is a very effective way of shutting down counter spells. So these two cards kind of do the same. Um, well, I mean, they, they attack your opponent on the same axis, and that is to to stop counter magic dead in its tracks, more or less. Um, these also are sort of would be quite obvious to, to bring in against miracles if you, if you were to have these in your sideboard. I don't think they are like super uh, effective ways to, to, for us, I mean, the thing is, like a lot of the time, decks will be attacking us from multiple angles. So, like City of Sol Solitude is, I think, is really good against miracles. The only other decks that these sort of cards should come in against would be like probably blue-based combo decks, so like show and tell decks. And I think a three mana enchantment is might just be a bit too slow. You don't want to like tap out on turn three and just pass the turn against a, a combo deck that can also just go fish you. And similarly, although less drastically, I think Defense Grid, I mean, if I if I were running Defense Grid in my sideboard, I probably would bring it in against Show and Tell. But 
yeah, I don't know. It feels like there are better things to be doing in those matchups. So probably this would be a, a, like cards against miracles. Now, carpet of flowers is um, maybe bomb against blue decks is a bit of an overstatement, but it can function that way. It basically lets you cast or not cast, but it basically works out to be the same as uh, like casting a free ritual every turn only like for any mana uh, any one color of mana and like against miracles this like they cannot function without deploying multiple island based lands so like multiple tundras volcanic islands and, and islands so like against miracles you are going to be getting a lot of mana out of this and what this does is in that particular matchup it lets us play around like being bottlenecked on mana for our initial couple of spells on our big combo turn also it can let us pay for some numbers of some number of copies of flusterstorm all around this is just like really powerful i don't think any miracles player ever is going to be happy to see you resolve this um Another place where it's really good, or can be really good, although not that good, but that's against uh, Delver decks. So, like, because Delver decks run a lot of soft permission, like Days and Spell Pierce mostly. And having, like, if you can stick a Carpet of Flowers early on, having those extra one or two mana, and it's not going to be more against the Del Delver deck, but just having, like, that one or two extra mana every turn can do like a ton of work for you and can let you sort of wiggle your way out from under like a like a pierce force day's hand where otherwise you would be unable to do that mind you though it can this, this this is not a mana ability because it targets so it can be stifled it's not terribly relevant but it's nice to know also um like uh the, the, I, the thing about the thing where the place where this is just just a little bit vulnerable in Delver matchups is that it forces you to fetch out your blue duel, opening yourself up to wasteland. Also, Delver decks don't have to deploy a lot of lands, so like I said, you probably won't be getting more than one or two islands out of them, and they can even like if if they end up like putting you under enough pressure, they can do stuff like wasteland themselves to cut you off mana. I've had that happen to me before. Much to my chagrin. But yeah, overall a pretty awesome card against island based decks, but I wouldn't be bringing this in against like combo, against blue based combo, because again, it just, well, and that might not be correct, but, but it just, I, this feels more like a card that allows you to progress into the mid game than the ends of the late game and against combo things might be over uh, too quickly and so the last card on this uh, in this grouping is the sensei's divining top now this is a sort of a almost like a jack of all trades uh kind of card in this deck and like i i like to run like a single in the main if 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 i can and but but if not then maybe having one one or two in the sideboard can be really good this is a house against miracles it's absolutely awesome there because the games go so long and just to be able to to rival them for digging power and also acting like a functional eighth card on your big combo turn or just like an extra card can be super it's also like really really good in the mirror match like mirror matches i think usually turn into like longer grind fests and, and and then like top is just the bossiest card when they don't turn into grind fests it's just over on like turn one or two and in that case top is kind of weak but I, I i really like it there against any discard deck really like like smallpox although that's not really a deck but like uh jund shardless agent like having giving out a top just because it can function as that extra card later and it also lets you dig uh, so well it just makes it really uh, useful in, in, in like discard matchups 
All right, so that was the first group of cards. Let's jump on to the second one. All right, so for the second group of cards, uh, I'm going to be looking at cards that answer hate bears. Um, now there are there are several more that aren't here, but I just thought I'd I'd give you sort of a yeah. Uh, a semi panoramic view, I guess, uh, of of the, the the cards that answer the hate bear decks. And by hate bears, we we usually have to contend with Thalia, uh, Ether Sworn Canonist, and Gadok Teague. And there are some others like a Meddling Mage, uh, I guess Phyrexian Revoker, maybe some more. But like those are the most common ones, I think, at, at least at, at this point. And so let, let let's have a look here. And maybe we should group them like this because I think Dread of Night and Massacre are probably the most commonly used cards that solely target hate bears. Dread of Night is an enchantment. It's incredibly cheap and incredibly powerful. Like white creatures get minus one, minus one. Basically, switches off somewhere between twelve and sixteen creatures from death and taxes. Now unfortunately you need two to shut them completely down. Because with one you, their Ether Swan Cannonist still gets to live. But that's a really nice choice. So so, so yeah, I guess the, the downside to this card is you need I would say you need to run three if you're running them because you want to see two. You want to have like a realistic chance of seeing two if you're up against death and taxes. So another hoser against death and taxes is massacre. So four mana for a sorcery that gives negative two, negative two to all creatures is not very good. But this, uh, like this, the Nemesis uh, expansion contained these cards that had these clauses in, like if, if you can if you control a land type and your opponent controls another land type, you can pay, cast a spell for free. So your opponent needs to be controlling a plane, you need to be controlling a swamp. And against death and taxes, that that is like not a very difficult uh condition to, to meet. And having played a lot of death and taxes myself, I can tell you that it is by far not like a given that you're able to play around this, even if you're like if if you're aware of, of of it being a card, like even if your opponent playing Death and Taxes knows that you're running massacres, they can't for sure play around this. I mean, if you're Death and Taxes and you get a, a, an opening hand of like Planes, Planes, Thalia, Canonist, and some other cards against Storm, like after sideboard, you have to keep that, even though you have the the Planes. Like ideally, what you want there would be like Caracas Wasteland, and then those cards like Thali and Chemist, because then you, you you don't have to open yourself up to Massacre. But Massacre is just an incredible card against Death and Taxes. And if I were to to head into a ma uh, like a meta where Death and Taxes was everywhere, I would run Massacre. Massacre's big big weakness though is that it cannot be cast when Gadok Teague is around. And that's a problem because against Maverick, you want to be answering Gadok Teague. So it's a problem that the, the very card you bring in is uncastable with Teague on the board. So be mindful of that. And also, like I, I, I'm going to be touching on other removal spells later on that might also come in against Death and Taxes, but that are not specifically aimed at the, the, the creature uh, decks, the hate bear decks. All right, so another sweet is Pyroclasm. Pyroclasm conveniently deals with Gadok Teague because it, it can be cast. What what Pyroclasm though sort of stumbles against is Mother of Runes, ironically. Like if your opponent goes turn one Mother of Runes, turn two Thalia, or turn two Gadok Teague, then you basically need two Pyroclasm to answer. Uh, because the first one, Mother of Runes, will just give protection to the creature that, you know, matters. Uh, also, having your answer be not red, sorry, having your answer not be black or blue is a, is a definite uh, negative. So this being red, I mean, it's, it's our tertiary color, so it's not that bad. Um, it's better than it being green, but it's still sort of 
like you're running one or maybe two red producing uh, lands in your deck so that's kind of vulnerable i only i i i've only ever played pyroclasm in my sideboard when i was running builds with burning wish and then i would usually run like a massacre and a pyroclasm i'd be able to bring one of them in post sideboard and be able to wish for the other all right so the last two are a bit more sort of off the beaten path one is slaughter pact and i mean i think this is a perfectly serviceable uh card it suffers from the same sort of vulnerability vulnerability to um to mother of runes but other than that it's awesome at being free uh and against thalia decks our mana is oftentimes really at a premium which is also why massacre is so good um i don't know though the, the thing about it is it only answers one and sometimes you need to be able to answer two and it's not versatile enough probably like if i want spot removal i kind of like spot removal the answer is more than just a creature like maybe you need to to kill like a, a ley line of sanctity or something where like at, at an instant speed removal spell you can probably do something a bit better with your with your time than this but it's like again if i was like super duper afraid of death and taxes i might I don't hate having like a singleton slaughter pack to sort of supplement my two massacre, for instance. All right, the last one is, is is really funky. I've never really done this, but I've always I've always kind of wanted to, and that's to run Caracas because Caracas is an uncounterable, I guess, practically like split second version of a, of a bounce spell for Thalia and Gadoctik. Unfortunately, Caracas doesn't answer uh, some number of other troublesome hate bears like uh, mainly Aethersworn Canonist and Middling Mage. However, Caracas gets to double as also like an answer to Reanimator and Show and Tell decks that like to bring in Grizzlebrand or Iona, Shield of Amiria. So it's not completely out of bounds to consider this, but I think like one of the, my biggest issues with it, with Caracas, at least as it pertains to bouncing Thalia, is that like every deck that runs Thalia is running at least four wastelands and probably also four shot and ports. Now port is a little bit like it's not that important, uh, but but yeah, waste four wastelands. You don't want to you don't want them to have an answer for your answer for their answer kind of thing. So. Yeah, probably not, but it's a, it's a it's a nifty idea, anyways. All right, so moving on to the next group of cards, and and the next group of cards is the answer to permanence. That's what I've called it. So now, is Thalia and all the other hate bears are they not permanents? Well, you bet they are. I guess what I mean by here is um, non hate bear permanence, but these can also, most of them, answer the hate bears. So that is sort of what I touched on before. So you have um, Chain of Vapor is probably the most versatile. It it lets you bounce any non land permanent, and then it has this weird clause where it's a like the controller of the permanent bounce can sacrifice a land to copy chain of paper. This does not count towards storm, but it does let you at times just build up more storm because what you can do is say your opponent has like a Gadoctique and you want to get rid of him and you want to win at this turn. So what you can do is you can play out a Lion's Eye Diamond and a Lotus Petal. And then you can cast Chain of Vapor on your Lotus Petal. And you can sacrifice two lands to copy it first onto your Lion's Island. And then onto your opponent's Gadoctique. So Gadoctique gets bounced. And the great thing is also, like, we never have any permanent they care about, that they or we care about getting bounced. So it, it's not symmetrical, really. 
I mean, they don't, they can't profitably sack a land to get a, like a value out of that thing, that part of the card. So Galaxy gets bounced, and we now have our two free artifacts in hand. We can replay them. So we have, with Chain of Vapor, added uh, two extra free Storm, if that makes sense. Now, Chain of Vapor's biggest problem is it doesn't bounce a Chalice for one, unless your opponent is forgetful. So against, like, Chalice decks, Echoing Truth and Turquoise Call are quite good. Echo and Truth is, uh, lets us bounce uh, an on-land permanent and every permanent named the same. So that, I think like Echo and Truth is probably the least played of these cards. Um, it's worse at, at bouncing a single troublesome permanent than Chain of Vapor is because it costs a mana more. And against the Thalia deck, if it is for instance Thalia we're bouncing, we're the, then playing, paying three mana instead of two. And that's a big difference, and that's a big like inconvenience. This can, this also, I think it's it's it's, it's basically a case of having the high ceiling and the lowest floor. Um, like I have tried my opponent having like double chalice for one, and then chalice for zero, and then echoing true thing end of turn and just winning, and that felt incredible, obviously. Or like echoing truthing two meddling mages also is just incredible. Um, I think I would probably bring this in against like decks that I would expect to have artifact hate against me. So sphere of resistance, Trinisphere, chalice of the void. But if we're looking at cards that handle those card kinds of effects, I think Hercules Recall probably does a better job because it lets you bounce. All artifacts that a play, that a player uh, controls. So your opponent could basically be sitting on two Chalice of uh, Chalice of the Voids, a Sphere of Resistance, and a Trinisphere, and you get to pay three mana end of turn, bounce all four, and then you win the game. That's the theory, anyways. The problem with Hercules Recall though is that it only targets artifacts. So again, we're sort of uh, you know, at a bit of a stalemate between all these three cards, they all do great things, but like Hercules can't bounce a Thalia, Echoing Truth um, can often only bounce one thing. Chalice of the Void also only bounces one thing, but costs the least mana.
So yeah, between these three blue cards, it's I think it's hard to to know which one is better. It really depends on what the meta is looking like. I, I think I always like Chain of Vapor a lot, and I would definitely be bringing in Chain of Vapor against the Hate Bear decks as well, for sure, if I had it. Uh, I think out of the three blue cards, it's the most effective card in those matchups. I think Echo and Truth is sort of like the in-between card. Like, if I want a blue card to answer Hate Bears, but I'm also worried about a lot of artifact hate, maybe I need to be boarding Echo and Truth and over Chain of Vapor because Chain of Vapor just it crumbles to Chalice of the Void. And if I'm thinking that I really need to be answering Artifact Hate, Artifact Hate in a big way, then Hercules Recall might be the way to go, but yeah. And then the last part of the group is Abrupt Decay. And Abrupt Decay is mainly here to answer Counterbalance. That it also answers Hate Bears and Chalice of the Void is it's, it's, it's nice, it's, it's neat. But being like off color in our I don't even know the word when it's the fourth you know like the primary, the secondary, the tertiary and the quadary it's probably incorrect but you know what I mean being green is a big cost because a lot of decks that run hateful artifacts and hateful and, and hate bears also run wasteland that's also why it's so good against miracles because they don't run wasteland so we are sort of not punished for splashing a fourth color. This is basically a must have card in your sideboard as long as Miracles is as big of a deck as it is. It's it, That's just a fact, I think. There was a time when running three was sort of, I think, okay, but Miracles is just that was maybe like two years ago. I think Miracles has just gotten so popular that I wouldn't leave home without four. Plain and simple. Um, that also means that this can sometimes double as sort of redundant removal for hate bears. So like you might run a, a massacre, a chain of vapor, and two abrupt decays in against death and taxes, and that's fine. It's not as good as like two massacre, a slaughter pack, and two chain of vapor, but uh, Abrupt Decay could sort of do a job there. Same against the, the Chalice decks like uh, Eldrazi and, and Mud. Alright. So. Alright, so the next group of cards I've labeled as the Anti Combo Package. Um, so, there are two kinds of combo decks roughly um, one, one, one is uh, blue based force of will based I guess and those are show and tell and reanimator mainly and then high tide kind of but not really it's not really a, it's just very rarely played deck uh, these days and then you have the other Group of combo decks, which is uh, like the, I guess the mirror match, and then all the other like fast combo decks like uh, Oops All Spells or Reanimator or Burning Reanimator. Like there are different uh, iterations. Yeah, actually, sorry, not Reanimator, like Tin Fins, because Reanimator, this regular style of Reanimator has Force of Will. So like basically the the decks that can combo you but have force backup and the decks that can combo you but they have to just goldfish you basically and I would say that probably these two the flusterstorm and surgical extraction those two come in against like all of the combo decks more or less at least the flusterstorm flusterstorm is relevant against um, show and tell it's relevant against against Entomb, Out of Reanimate, Reanimator. It's relevant against like uh, a Seeding Song out of Belcher or a Burning Wish there. And it's relevant against your opponents, uh, your Mirror Match opponents, Infernal Tutor. So I like it, it, it. Like it's not a given that we want answers for combo in our sideboard, 
But if we do, then I think Cluster Storm is a very valid sort of choice. And it also has a, like applications against other matchups. But I'll, I'll get back to that. Surgical, surgical Extraction is like an alternative to Cluster Storm. I would rarely, if ever, dedicate more than two slots in my sideboard for the combo matchup. And I prefer to have two of the same card here than one of each. And that would usually be Cluster Storm. But if not, then Surgical Extraction is a valid. Uh, choice here. Uh, Reanimator is a really bad matchup for us, so like having something that specifically targets them is, is nice. It can sort of mess up the mirror match and uh, dredge. I don't think I'd ever really want to bring this in against show and tell because it kind of means either they have cast show and tell and have resolved it and then we've probably lost, or we need to get lucky and discard it and then have surgical extraction. So and even then they might like sneak attack us to death so I, I don't like that and I included Nihil Spellbomb but I've never played it I've it's just the fact that you can cantrip and let you draw a card is not irrelevant I've seen people play this in Doomsday actually because it lets you draw the first card off the Doomsday pile but I think what was true against, uh, like for surgical extraction, is also true for Neil Spellbomb. Like it's the same matchups that those two cards are like are good, but I don't think they do enough like against a, a broad spectrum of card uh, of matchups. The last one here is the Xantus Swarm, and like I I mentioned back in the uh, in, in the section about the the bomb since flu cards, this kind of qualifies as a bomb against the blue deck as well. So. This, if this ever resolves against a blue based combo deck, or any blue deck really, if it gets to survive an attack, you get to do whatever you want the coming, the, the, like the following main phase. The reason why this is especially good against like blue based combo decks is that they don't have removal. Like, usually they don't. They might anticipate you bringing this in and then bring in like answers for it. But in like in the broader sense, they don't have removal. You shouldn't be expecting it. And like you resolve this against like show and tell, and you are like I think most of the time when I've resolved this, I've won. Not all the time, obviously. You can you can resolve it and pass a turn, lose on that turn. But it it's brutal against show and tell. If I was expecting a lot of show and tell, like if show and tell becomes a tier one deck again, it becomes like a mainstay of the, the the top tables you bet I'd be packing a couple of standard swarms at least maybe as, as many as three um, it's also nice to bring in three animator although that deck is so fast that like it's, it's it, there there is a, a lesser probability it feels like for it to be relevant there I'd also consider this against a uh, deck like in fact uh, probably also against like blue based decks that don't have uh, like ways to remove this basically so like Merfolk I'd bring this in if I had it in my sideboard um, yeah and the reason I didn't put it in the blue bomb thing was that I don't think this comes in against miracles I mean it can and it can be good but miracles are anticipating us having creatures so miracles are leaving in like a couple of source of plowshares and maybe a terminus and maybe they'll bring in like engineered explosives and if this ever dies if this ever trades with a source of plowshares then that's terrible then you have traded a bomb out of your deck like a, like a high impact card that you were counting on doing a lot of work with a card that would otherwise have been completely dead out of theirs so we don't want to be doing that. That's like, if Xantid Swarm comes in against Miracles, then, like, you have to consider what card is it replacing. If, it, if it's replacing a discard spell, then that basically means you discarded a source of plowshares out of their hand, which you would never do. If it comes in again, like, in, in, in place of a cantrip, then you are having your cantrip countered by a source of plowshares, which is also pretty bad. So, yeah. You have to consider that, and the same thing goes for Delver decks, especially red-based Delver decks, because 
they will keep in some number of lightning bolts and it's just too high risk of this getting bolted and then it's sort of the same premise you've traded your high impact car to get you know for a, for a bolt so all right so the last group of cards here we have the creature plan and this is a bit of a of i don't know how, well, how to really put it this is the closest thing we come to like having a transformational sideboard i think and you can sort of go approach this in a shallow way or a deep way uh, like you can commit yourself and have like a full playset of a uh, creature plan or you can maybe have two to supplement your other like your existing plan and let's run through the different choices here so I, I think actually dark confidant is the one that that kind of is different from the other so let's take that one first Dark Confidant would come in against miracles if you if if you had it. Like if you approach the miracles matchup post sideboard as a sort of a grind where you need to like if you're bringing in several storm cards, then each card in your hand is potentially a spell, is potentially a storm count. Plus, Dark Confidant can swing in, and every time Dark Confidant connects against your miracles opponent, it's one less storm that you have to, you know, cast. One less spell you have to cast on your combo turn. And Dark Confidant is basically like a must answer, like bullseye, aim the nukes kind of card for miracles. They cannot allow this to just, you know, stay uncontested. But that also means that they probably will have, like I just mentioned, removal. Also, like the attacking with him kind of thing is. Well, I mean, you can basically never ever attack into uh, blue generic. If they have blue and then another mana open ever, you can't attack with Dark Confidant because you have to respect them having Snapcaster Mage, which they will happily trade off just as a one for one. So, and Miracles, in case you didn't know, like will often have open mana. So, <clears throat> that kind of that point kind of uh, isn't that. Isn't that uh, relevant actually? And then it's just like again, if 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 I had like seventeen or twenty sideboard slots, I would run a couple of these guys for sure because it is really really good against miracles. But it's sort of high risk, high reward, high variance kind of thing. If they happen to have their plowshares, then you've tapped out on turn two to let them just counter whatever you did on turn two with a source of flashes which is just really bad uh, okay so the other three cards are like the grow plan kind of maybe not yeah, so much but um this is mostly for the miracles match i i think i some people will, will bring this in against other stuff and it can be really good so young pyromancer monster mentor like the grow plan where like our deck is built of cantrips and rituals and discard spells and those all work really well with these kind of creatures where you get to just swarm the board with uh, with an army of tokens. Monster Mentor in particular is just insane. Um, the thing though is, like again, you you get blown out by a creature removal and if they know it's coming it's even worse like if they keep uh, terminus and, and, and engineer explosives and stuff like that I have had a lot of fun and also quite a bit of success with young power Master before and I wouldn't completely rule out running them again at some point but right now I just don't really see it coming in against anything other than miracles and as such as I, I think they're just more like more impactful cards the same kind of goes for Monster Mentor. This is an even more swingy card. It can absolutely, completely blow your opponent out of the water, but it's off color. It, it requires us to splash the fourth, the fifth color, sorry, and it's a mana more expensive. So for me, I, I, I don't see this being a relevant card, but I brought it in because some people have played and it sort of, it, it, it bears mentioning. The last card I will admit to having not actually tried, but it sort of plays on the same axis. 
although it has some like benefits and also disadvantages to, to the other cards it can block like it can actually sit there and hold off uh, like a nimble mongoose or a young pyromancer or something it also can bounce stuff I mean that's not irrelevant you might even want to be bouncing like hate bears or something or some Eldrazi creatures and it's pretty big when it when it flips and you just get to, to, to swing in for seven right away that being said I'm not really seeing it like I don't think if you're if you bring this in against death and taxes and you manage to to cast four instant or sorcery spells and not be dead by that then I guess you're doing pretty okay anyway and like um, against miracles is uh, like having this plowshare is just going to be the biggest sucker punch um, and you're not really gaining a lot from bouncing their stuff because they don't have stuff or if they do it's like stuff they wouldn't mind having bounced like snapcaster mage so they get to reuse it and like against delver yeah gosh I don't know like like Insectile Aberration still flies uh, over it until we ba we, we flip it. Uh, it might be good against Elber, but yeah, I'm not really seeing it. But anyways, it, it's an option and it's a way to sort of fool your opponent, kind of like if they it, like if if any opponent is does not anticipate these cards, you can blow them out of the water. Like the the problem is like against experienced players they like they are more uh, likely to know that storm might bring in stuff like this so they're more likely to be prepared for it all right so those were the sort of groupings of cards that usually will comprise a sideboard and the way you you, you choose to, 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 to build your actual sideboards how much of this and that you, you want I think you need to, to sort of work that out. You can you can you can look at lists. Um, just know that you will need to be able to answer miracles. You will need to be able to answer hateful permanence in some fashion. And you probably want to have some sort of edge in the combo uh, mirror matches. But try to work out like which is the most troublesome uh, like. Group, groupings of, 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 of matchups that you need. And in the following section, I'll be running through the most common of the legacy sort of decks and how I approach uh, sideboarding against those.